Now another word of prayer as we think of God, Jehovah Rapha, which means our healer. Why don't we need that right now? Isn't healing on all levels the need of the hour? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're not asking you to be Jehovah Rapha. You are. This is how you've described yourself. Lord, heal us. Heal our bodies. Heal our souls. Heal our nation. For your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. We find this phrase in Exodus chapter 15, which rehearses the story of the children of Israel and their desperate need for water. Three days into the desert, they had found no water source until they came to the waters of Marah. But those waters were bitter, undrinkable. Moses cried out to God for a healing of the waters, and God answered. He led Moses to throw a tree into the waters. He had an answer, and the waters were healed. Then later on in that chapter, God tells Moses that I am the Lord that healeth thee, Jehovah Rapha. I not only heal waters, I heal people. Regarding the subject of healing, we surely have something front and center before us today, COVID-19. It's a problem all over the world. I read, I read missionary letters on Wednesday night in our prayer fellowship, and almost all the missionaries, no matter their field, they're dealing with COVID-19 issues. Solomon Raju, our missionary to India, he's lost three pastor friends to COVID-19. What's the answer? Or perhaps an even bigger question, who has the answer? Well, one thing we can agree on this morning is no one can agree on who has the answer. What can heal? What will protect? Some say quarantine. Some say don't quarantine. Some say wear a mask. Some say don't wear a mask. We need a vaccine. Some say no, that'd be a big mistake. No vaccine for viruses. Who has the answer? God has the answer. Now, will he heal everyone physically? Well, we know according to the God's word, no. Did Paul find physical healing for his thorn in the flesh? No. God allowed Paul's thorn in the flesh to remain for a greater spiritual purpose. I want to move away from the subject of physical healing. I suspect today that more of you are in need of emotional healing or mental healing. Wounds from the past, emotional hurts from maybe your past sin, or maybe from the sin of others. Can you find healing for your soul today? Who has the answer? God has the answer. Pastor Chris mentioned a week ago that several of our teenagers made public decisions to follow God during ACA's, our Christian school's recent week of special chapels. And those teens talked about what they were struggling with. About 60% of those 12 to 18-year-olds are struggling with a past hurt. They're struggling with bitterness. The answer for those kids is God's healing touch. If you are hurting today, God is your answer. He is your Jehovah Rapha. He is, let me put it this way, the perfect, the all-wise expert who knows exactly what your soul's disease is, and he knows what's needed to heal. He is not puzzled. He does not need to do, do more research. He does not need to gather a, a panel of experts to figure out what's going on in your soul. He is the expert. He is Jehovah Rapha. So go to him today. Look to him for answers. He is the Lord that heals.
before we hear the scripture this morning, 258, our final song together before the scripture, there is a fountain filled with blood. and third psalm, the first four verses. It reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what comfort the words of the psalmist giving 3,000 years ago are, are to us still today. While the current events that we face have the effect of paralyzing many people with fear and terror, I pray that your word would give us as born-again believers peace and perspective. While the world would believe that physical death to be the most tragic outcome of our existence your word reveals that death without your forgiveness, without your redemption, this is true tragedy. Father, today we glory that you are the healer of diseases, yes, but also as the passage has revealed that you are the forgiver of all our iniquities, our sin, and that you have redeemed, you have bought us to keep us from an eternal destruction in hell, which is truly the most tragic outcome anyone could ever experience. May our reliance be not in our temporal, physical well-being, but in an unwavering trust in you, our great God who holds our eternal future in your hands. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Once again, the offering plates will be at the head of the aisles at the end of the service, and you can also utilize the offering box at the uh, rear of the sanctuary. There is more healing to be done. We're about to go to God's word, and he'll show us more he would like to do in us. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. Our prayer just before we hear the word this morning. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly
Open your Bibles with me. Sure, my. Open your Bibles with me to the book of um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, let's stand together as we prepare to read God's Word. The children may be dismissed without running. You can walk, guys. There you go. Um, four and five year olds out the back door, first through sixth grade out this side. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Let's begin reading. But now, when Timotheus, that's Timothy, came un, from you unto us and brought us good tidings, good news of your faith and charity and your love, and that ye had good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted, encouraged over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if you, ye, plural, stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. I'd be able to give you all the rest of the stuff I want to teach you. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And Lord, make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word. I pray that you bless the preaching of it. Lord, you have promised that your word would not return void. And so now, uh, Lord, this morning I preach your word and I seek to communicate the truth, knowing the promise that you've given about the blessing of your word being poured upon the hearts of people. We understand, Lord, our acceptance of your word, our willingness to see you in it, our willingness to take it and apply it to our lives it is our path to a relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll transform us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to deal with the subject of encouragement this morning. Now, let me just tell you as I, as I begin, I am not preaching as an expert on this issue. You say, what do you mean by that? Have you ever noticed that some people have the spiritual gift of encouragement? I don't know if you've all figured out that Brother Jeff, gracious, here, kind of has that gift. And by the way, the real gift, because he does it in a right way. Now, I will tell you, if there was anything in my whole spiritual life in which I kind of struggle with and I don't do very well with, it's encouragement. 
I, and here, here's, I'll just be pretty transparent with you about some of my weaknesses. First of all, my tendency is to be a fixer. I mean, I want to fix, fix any, you know, when somebody comes to me with an issue, I want to fix it. When somebody comes with, I, and it doesn't matter whether it's a car or a typewriter, or do they have typewriters? Uh, or, you know, or a piece of equipment or uh, something going on in your life. That's my tendency. I just, you know, some of you are like that. You know what I'm talking about. Whatever it is, you want to fix it. It's also my tendency to want to do whatever I'm doing in life. We always want to, how can we do it better? Okay, we're doing it this way. How can we do this better? That's, that's my personal tendency. Now, when, the, when that's the way you think, you tend to not be a very good encourager. I'm not using that as an excuse. I'm just telling you where I am because some of you might be there. So I will tell you, as I came to this passage of Scripture, I'm looking at this passage of Scripture, I'm learning stuff. So would you learn with me? Okay, that's what we're going to do. Now, let's, as we come to this passage of Scripture, this is really fascinating because we're talking about the subject of encouragement. Do, would you agree in the United States of America today, people need encouragement? I mean, everybody's, I mean, our theme of worship this morning is Jehovah, our healer, and everybody's talking about wanting, wanting to heal a nation. Now, if healing is bringing people together, I, can we admit the past presidential administration didn't do that, right? That didn't happen. And no matter what people think, the next one isn't going to do it either, Right? And, and people, they, they want to be, they want to heal. We want to bring physical healing and we want to be spiritual healing. We want to bring all of these things. And we want to encourage people on all these things. One of the problems is this. It is really difficult to encourage someone who doesn't believe in God, who doesn't believe in this book, and who doesn't know him as Lord and Savior. Now, I can preach this message this morning to you on healing. But it's really hard for me. And there's a sense in which it's almost unethical for me to try to use the promises of the word of God, which are intended for people who have their faith placed in Jesus Christ, to encourage people who do not have their faith placed in Jesus Christ. To say to an unbelievable, uh, uh, unbelievable, unbeliever, everything is going to be okay, is a lie. You can trust in God. You say to a, to a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can trust in God. Well, actually, n- not really without placing your faith in him. And there's a tendency for us as believers to want to want to communicate the promises of God to his people, to people who do not know him. And so we, we have to be careful about that. And if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this message is for you if you're willing to establish a relationship with God through repentance and through faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, and have you ever noticed, have you ever watched people who are unsaved try to encourage one another? Have you heard some of the things they say? Like, and here's, here's, some people are just not very good at encouragement. You know what I'm talking about? I saw this one. I just Googled internet. You get all of these, you Googled uh, encouragement on the internet and you just, you get all of these, these things. How about this one? You're beautiful no matter what everybody else says. Some people just don't, don't quite know how to do it. Or, or sometimes, you know, they, they, they know how to say the thing that just undermines it. Or they say things that are just, I don't know how to describe the word. Well, I do know how to describe it. It's just a word I don't like to say in, in the pulpit. It's just stupid. Every day can be the best day of your life. Guess what? No, it can't. I mean, it's just not, it's not possible. 
It's not realistic. And people say these things like, ooh, this is really great, except it's really stupid. It's not true. And when you're really hurting, right? And you're really suffering, and people say things like this to you, it just makes it worse, not better. Say so they say things like this. Just believe in yourself. And you say, but the reason I'm miserable is I have failed myself over and over and over again. I know me and I'm a mess. If your path to encourage, I would tell you this, if my path to encouragement is believing in myself, I might as well just end it now. But this is, this is what the world has to offer. By the way, I didn't go looking for bad ones. These are just the first ones that came up. How about this one? Live your dream. Man, you know, quit you know, that nine to five job. Just go live your dream. Isn't that what everybody's trying to do? I mean, one of the reasons people are sometimes discouraged is because they can't do that. That's what they're trying to do. This, this is some of the best stuff the world has to offer as far as encouragement. I'm, I'm serious. This, I'm not trying to be overly critical. When you don't know God, you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you have no sense of his presence in your life, you have no sense of, of his power in your life, w upon what basis do you encourage? How do we encourage one another? Now, this is not a you must encourage one another. This is how do we do it? Okay, how do you, how do I encourage you? How do you encourage me? How do you encourage one another? Because mutual encouragement is one of our, our responsibilities to, believer, to other believers. And it's, it's a responsibility that all of us have to one another. Now, the now, wonderful thing about this is that we have the possibility of doing this. It's real. And we can do it based upon the word of God and with sincere truth. So let's take a look. When we come to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 or chapter 3, we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, remember we talked about this, is probably in Corinth. He's on his second missionary journey. He's writing to the church in Thessalonica, which was established also on the second missionary journey probably just months before. It might be a little bit further than that. We could be maybe a year or so. It depends on how long it took him to go from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea to Athens to, to Corinth. That's the process that he went on that second missionary journey. We do know that he was only a few weeks in Thessalonica. Then he's in Berea. He's there. A church begins to be established in Berea. Then the, then the Judaizers from, from Thessalonica come to Berea, and they stir things up, and he has to leave Berea, and he goes to Athens. And while he's in Athens, he's going to Mars Hill and trying to debate with the philosophers, and that doesn't really go that well. He, in Athens, Paul uses a different evangelism method than he normally would do. He normally went to the synagogue, and in the synagogue, he, he began to talk with people who had an understanding of the Word of God, and from that, there would be believers, and then there would be uh, Gentiles who were devout, who were also interested, and from that group, he would establish a church of, of Gentiles and Jews coming together who have some interest in the Word of God and then are truly transformed, and from that they would reach the community. But when he comes to Athens, he goes to Mars Hill and he's going to have this debate with the philosophers because that was, his, that was the way he grew up. That was, the, that was his education he, with these educated people. And, of course, that didn't go very well. He describes coming to Corinth in 2 Corinthians when he comes with much sadness and sorrow and down, down at heart. He was discouraged by the time he came to Corinth. After all, he had met spiritual opposition in every city. He had met hardship in every city. And yet in the middle of all that, God was doing great things. And so we know when Paul was writing, or when, when Paul comes to Corinth, that he is discouraged. And part of what encourages him is news that he gets from Timothy. 
Now, what had happened? When he came to Athens, he was concerned about the believers that were in Thessalonica and the persecution they might be facing. And the fact that he had to leave soon, and he really didn't leave that city with this, the kind of spiritual leadership that they needed. So he's in Athens and he sends Timothy, young man in the faith, not very old, um, but he sends Timothy to find out how things are going. And we saw this in the first part of chapter one. He goes and he finds that they're doing great. Now, they are not spiritually mature. They have a lot of knowledge that they need to gain. They don't have all the theology down, especially the theology with regard to last things. We'll find out as we go through First and Second Thessalonians that they were confused about the coming of the Lord, and, and it was, they, they were right for false teachers but because they didn't have right doctrine. But there had been a, tra- a true transforming work in their lives. The Holy Spirit had come in. When the Holy Spirit comes in, by the way, he not only comes in, he produces change. Holy Spirit does not move in and everything stay the same. If you're here this morning and you say, I, I trust, I got saved. You know, I walked an aisle and I prayed a prayer. But nothing transformed in your life. Nothing changed. No attitude changed. No heart changed. No appetite changed. None of those things. You really need to re-examine whether you truly trusted Jesus Christ. You know, guys, especially those, those of you are a little bit older. You know what I'm talking? You got married and your new wife moved in. Things changed, right? Style of furniture changed. The wardrobe changed. I, uh, when we first got married, I... I had an apartment already. Had no furniture, but I had an apartment. Had a wardrobe in the closet. My wife moved in. Next thing you know, things started disappearing from the closet. Honey, where are those shoes? And of course, this, you know, early in the marriage, I wouldn't say she was lying. She just played innocent. What shoes? Are you really? Oh, oh yeah. Where did that shirt go? I was really proud of that shirt. But some things, you know, those boots with the zips. Anyway, I... (laughs) When a new wife moves in, things change. When the Holy Spirit moves in, things change. (laughs) There's a new passion. It isn't just about, oh, I want to get rid of the consequences of sin in my life. You know, I feel bad about the thing that I did, and I don't want to feel bad about it anymore. And so I want forgiveness so that I can go on and do the same things that I was doing in my life. That's not transformation. But God gives me a love for him. My appetites, the things that I love, those things change. And so there was this transformation in the lives of the Thessalonians. And Paul hears from Timothy that this happens. And guess what? Paul had sent Timothy to be an encouragement to the Thessalonians. And it ended up the Thessalonians were the encouragement to Paul. Which is the first principle I want you to see in learning to encourage one another, and that is this, encouragement goes two ways. True encouragement is when we encourage one another. Now, sometimes we encourage one another in different ways, but there is an enthusiasm when we, when we truly encourage one another. He says here in verse 6, he says, but now when Timotheus came from you to us and brought to us good tidings of your faith and charity that we have good remembrance of you always, desiring greatly to see you as we are great, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. He said, I didn't, re-. he says, you want me back. You actually are looking forward to having me. You want me back. This is, this is mutual encouragement. He, they are encouraging me. You are encouraging me, and I am encouraging you. The most effective encouragement is going to be mutual encouragement. You'll be more of an encourager, by the way, when you choose to allow yourself to be encouraged by others. 
It's odd, but we do this. When, when we're having the pity party, you know what I'm talking about? And we're feeling sorry for ourselves, there's a tendency for us to reject true biblical encouragement from others. For us to reject the way that we view our lives and everything else. And so we just, we just want to feel sorry for ourselves and we might say, oh, well, I need to go encourage somebody else. I find this all the time in ministry. You know, you go, you go to a hospital or you go to visit with somebody or you try to go to help somebody who needs to be encouraged and you walk away having been encouraged by them. The first step is to realize that encouragement is mutual. The second is to share good news, chapter 3, verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you to us and brought us, notice that word, good tidings. You know what that word tidings means? We don't use that word. I have tidings. I, I doubt you have used that in your vocabulary recently. The word that we use today is very simple. It's, it's this, I have good news. This is how we describe what? The gospel. Gospel means good news. The world thinks that the gospel is bad news. Why do they think the gospel is bad news? Because they have an inflated view of self. If you are... If you think you're healthy and dealing with good, and dealing, you know, have, have good health in your life and everything is going okay, then um, nursery calls, that's what that is. If you think you're healthy and, the, and everything is going okay and, and, and the doctor says to you, listen, there's a 90% chance of recovering from cancer that you have, that's bad news. Why? because it's different than what your view is of yourself. But when you have a realistic view of yourself, and the doctor comes and says, hey, we have this particular solution, then the gospel becomes good news. But he says, we're going we're to share good news. And, and, and that is important. I, it is an interesting how oftentimes we love to share good news, or excuse me, share bad news and ignore good news. <clears throat> Haven't you seen it in the news media? I mean, you take a look at the headlines. I, it, just, it's just, it was almost comical to me to, to look at, I hate to bring this up, but it just fits, to look at COVID numbers in the news. And when the numbers are going up, everybody is talking about it. When the numbers are going down, everybody is ignoring it. Because perish the thought that somebody might get encouraged. Why? Well, bad news, controversy. We love to talk about that stuff. And oftentimes we just neglect sharing good news with others. You know, that good thing that happens, that encouraging thing that happens? You, you know, it, it might be, I, I just have to describe this. If it was me, okay, coming back, and my family understands this, they'll, they'll understand the humor in this maybe more than you will. Say that it was Kevin Shaw going to visit the church at Thessalonica and coming back and talking to the Apostle Paul. And Paul says to me, well, how are things going in Thessalonica? My standard answer would have been, good. Now, this is funny because when my, my family says, oh, when, you, when we get good out of you, it's like, whoa. I'm not saying that to commend myself. I am saying that because this is a problem for me that needs to be corrected. Moms and dads, if, if you've ever had a child that has some discipline issues, you kind of know what I'm talking about. 
you see the teacher coming and you want to turn and go the other way. And it's not because there's something wrong with the teachers. I love teachers. I have to say that. No, I I do really love teachers. (laughs) But you just sort of, okay, what do they do now? Okay, what's the problem now? Oh, no. What am I going to have to fix now? What a blessing it is when somebody also takes the time to give you good news. How that ministers to your soul. Share good news. What a blessing for Timothy to be able to come back and share good news, which, which means that you have to be intentional about it. By the way, people even in the world kind of un- understand this. There was a little, little book written years ago called The One Minute Manager. Anybody ever read the little book called The One Minute Manager? One of the things that was interesting to me in The One Minute Manager is there are some bosses that are always trying to catch somebody messing up. And and he said in that book that one one of the ways to be an effective manager is to purposefully try to catch people doing right. To purposefully try to catch people doing the right thing so that you can commend them, so you can give them good news. And that, doesn't, that isn't just an extension of your personality. That needs to be an intentional choice in the way that you function with one another. And you see this happening with Paul because Paul gets the good news, right? He gets the good news about the church of Thessalonica. So what does he do? He takes a pen and paper and he begins to write and he communicates back to them. Wow, I heard great stuff about you. He doesn't say, man, the first thing he doesn't say to them is you've got some doctrinal problems. They had some doctrinal problems. But the first thing that he says to them is, Wow, look at this testimony. Look at what God is doing in your life. And it was truth. It wasn't a lie. Share the good news. Focus on pleasant memories. You say, well, okay, what is the difference between focusing on pleasant memories and sharing the good news? I'll describe that here. Take a look at verse 6. But now when Timotheus came to you from us and brought us good tidings of your faith, and charity that you that you have good remember he says and that ye have good remembrance of us always now here's what he is describing he says you have pleasant memories of us now i want you to think about that for a moment the church at thessalonica that was a chosen point of view after all when the Apostle Paul showed up and began preaching at the church at Thessalonica, he's preaching to them, their people getting saved and their lives are being transformed, and then persecution comes. And now there are difficulties. And the people's lives, the lives of believers in Thessalonica, could, you could arguably say, say were more difficult after he came than before he came. So it would have been very easy for the church at Thessalonica to say, listen, see how good it was before? And look how much problems that we had after, right? That's a perspective. I remember one of our children, very little, had this wonderful day, about ready to go to bed at night, really upset. Sandy's talking to this child. I won't give the gender so you won't figure out which one it is. was upset. Well, what had happened was a little conflict had happened just before bed. And so Sandy's going through, well, this good thing happened today, and this good thing happened today, and this good thing happened today, and this good thing happened today. And it was this wonderful day, but this one thing happened late in the day. And that's all that, I almost said he or she, Um, that's all that person could think about. Are, are, Are you like that? 
He's, in order to be a good encourager, it means that you have to be disciplined with how you think in your own head. And what you remember and what you emphasize and what you meditate upon. It's, it's choosing a right point of view. Now, there's a key to that, and we'll see that here next. But it is a chosen point of view. I'm going to choose to remember the good stuff. Now, we, we do have, have a tendency. When I, you know, I want to have a bad attitude or I want people to feel sorry for me. I'm going to remember all the, good, the bad stuff. Now, there are some people, I mean, they, about their own previous lives, they remember all the good stuff. You know, I was a super mom and I was a super dad and everything was wonderful and life was great and there were no problems back in the good old days. The good old days were never quite as good as the good old days are portrayed to be. But we, in order to be an encourager, I have to meditate on sweet, wonderful, good, glorious things. It's a chosen attitude. It's a chosen point of view. And so it's not just... It's not just choosing to have the point of view, but then it's also immersing myself in that point of view. The psalmist talks about the meditations upon my bed fairly often. You know what I'm talking about? That time in the evening when you lay down on your bed to go to sleep, but it's before you actually go to sleep. Now, for some of you, that's like six seconds. And for some of you, for many of us, it takes a lot longer. And the things that go through your mind in that time can be life-transforming. And of course, you have to have a disciplined mind to think through those things. I w- I'll be honest, that's often my, for lack of a better way of saying, that's my worry time, that's when it's in the flesh, or my burden time when it's in the spirit. I might do more praying in that time than any other time in my day. As I am seeking in those moments to take those burdens upon my heart, the cares that I have for some of you, for, for some of you, for you, and to lay those before God and ask God to bless and ask God to do a work in life and ask God to encourage and, you know, all of those things, that's, that's the time. And the only way I have been able to survive sometimes in ministry is to choose a to deliberately meditate on what good things God is doing in the lives of people. See, good encouragement doesn't start with what you do. It starts all the way back in how you're thinking. You have to focus on that. Here's Paul says, you, you had great... He, it's almost like he's surprised. It's almost like you have fond memories of us. I was kind of afraid you were going to hate us. I know how that feels. Being a pastor for many years, I've had to have some difficult conversations with people. And there are times you kind of are concerned of whether this person is going to like you at all when it's over. And I, you know, when you have a difficult conversation and people know that you love them and then they wrap their arms around you and they say, even after that difficult conversation, thank you, pastor. There is, I will tell you, that is incredibly encouraging to me. And that's how Paul felt here. And that's because the Thessalonians saw things in true spiritual reality. 
The, the only way that they could have pleasant memories of Paul is if they were choosing to look at the spiritual benefit in their lives against the, the consequences in their lives, the persecution, the difficulties, the hardship, and began to understand that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. If, if you spend a lot of time meditating on Fox News and CNN and ABC and what all the others, you are going to be discouraged. And you are going to have to choose at times to turn that stuff off and think on better things. Meditate on the Lord. Deliberate meditation. By the way, when you are thinking like this, when, the, when, when you are choosing the pleasant memories and when you are you're willing to tell the good news, then, then that, that is what makes encouragement sincere. Have you ever had someone, they're trying to encourage you, but it's not really sincere? You know what I'm talking about. And sometimes they're genuinely trying to encourage you, but it's not coming from their soul. So they're just trying, oh, I've got to go encourage this person because it's the right thing to do. And I really, you know, they're, they're suffering and it's a, it's a difficult time. And so I want to encourage them. And so they're going and they're trying to think, okay, what are the right words to say? What are the right words to say? And then they come up with, you know, I, I've got to say this Bible verse or maybe this Bible verse or come up with this witty thing to say or this particular encouraging thing to say. And, and you can tell it's just, it's just words. It, it's... And you can tell it, you can feel it. It's just words that are coming through. And sometimes they're even the worst possible words. I've heard people try to encourage others when they're in this moment. And they're just the worst possible things to say. If you've gone through deep tragedy, and you know what I'm talking about, if you've gone through that deep tragedy, in those awkward moments where people that you love and care for you try to come and talk to you after you've gone through the tragedy, and they, they just don't know what to say. It's really difficult. But when you know that these people think the best of you, and they love you from the bottom of their hearts, then they hardly have to say anything. Focus on pleasant memories. Be thankful to God for one another. Verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you and all, your, uh, and all our afflictions as stress by faith. For now in you we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all of the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before God? He says, listen, he's talking about, you mean so much to me. In fact, I, I'm just... I don't know what more thanks I could give to God for you than, than these specific things. He's being very specific in his thankfulness. He said, I'm being thankful for your, for your faith. It, I'm just so thankful to be able to look at you and in you see this vibrancy of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so you are an occasion for me to look to God and say, thanks. I will tell you, that is encouraging, isn't it? When someone is giving thanks to God for you. He's, he says, I'm being thankful for your faith. He says, I'm, be, he's a, he says, I'm being thankful to God for you, which means that you are having a genuine impact upon me. And you are the one I'm trying to encourage. And I'm telling you that you have a genuine impact upon me for God. Now that is incredible, but that's what he said. Notice what he says here. He says, for now we live. We're living in, in, in your, I'm a, your success. The, I, it's verse eight is kind of hard to, to express. Your success makes me alive. Your success gives my, my life vibrancy. Your spiritual well-being, your spiritual growth 
This is the same type of thing that John said when he says, we have no greater joy than to see that our children walk in truth. And by the way, ch- children, kids, do you want to make your parents happy? You want to give them true joy? Their true joy is not in you avoiding all sin. Their true joy is when they know your hearts are for God. When they know above all things, you want to please God, not them, but God. True godly parents, that is the desire of their heart. Sometimes you think, as young people, that what my parents really want is for me to be submitted to them. As if being the boss of you is what gives them the most satisfaction in life. Can I tell you something? Just a little secret. They're kind of looking forward to the day when they're not the boss of you. Being your boss is not the easiest job in the world. They're looking forward to the day when you have surrendered your heart to him to lead you and guide you. And that they can be your friends in Christ and counselor. And that will give them joy. You want to encourage moms and dads? Do that. This is the genuine, this, he said, this is the genuine impact. He said, I really, I'm really living. In fact, you are giving me joy. Why? Because you are following the Lord because we see all that is going on. He says, you're the joy where would we joy for, for your sakes. He said, Paul, it doesn't matter. He was, he was tent making in Corinth. He was working with probably leather. He's probably a leather worker. So he's, he's working a job, but he's sweating. This is a guy that was very well accomplished. This was a guy who, uh, who could have been advanced in the world wherever he was and he was he's working and sweating the job and all by himself in the city of Corinth trying to share the gospel to this very wicked place he said none of that stuff matters what matters to me is when I hear what God has done in your life being thankful to one another and then he pray for one another chapter 3 verse 10 night and day praying exceedingly it's nearly impossible to truly encourage someone you will not pray for, you do not pray for, or will not pray for. Can I just say that again? It is nearly, and I said nearly because there might be an exception. I almost said it is impossible. I, I, I still haven't been able to think of an exception, but I don't want to say it, I can't really go to a verse and say that definitively. It is very difficult to, with your words, encourage someone you're not praying for. So pray for one another regularly. He says, I pray for you when? Night and day. Now, it doesn't mean that he was 24 hours a day in prayer for the Thessalonians, but he was in prayer for them all the time. He was thinking about them constantly. They're just on his mind. Typically, when students go off to college, mom and dad are thinking about them all the time. You know, that prayer where you're thinking about them and you're wondering, okay, they're probably in class right now. And so you're praying for them. Now, the kids that are in college are really not, usually not thinking about mom and dad all the time. Oh, dad's at work. Hmm. I wonder how work's going. It's usually not happening. By the way, that is... That is one of the ways to really make your prayer real for someone. Is to take a look at the clock and say, right now, they are probably doing this. You want to pray for a senator or the president or somebody like that? You look at your clock. This person is living right now, someplace, doing something right now. Involved in some activity at this moment right now. They're not just a fuzzy idea, they're a person. And praying for someone in that moment 
is important. He says, I'm praying for you regularly, night and day, that we might, that I might see your face. And it's this longing for true fellowship. It's not just prayer for, but this, this longing for true fellowship. I, I, we want to see you, and you want to see us. And then the last thing we talk about, and by the way, we wanted to edify, he says, that, which, that we may perfect or complete that which is lacking your faith. He says that I can to give you the rest of the stuff that I've been wanting to teach you. He's, Paul isn't having ex, some sort of exaggerated view of himself. He just knows that there was so much more to say that he didn't get a chance to say. Praying for one another. And then to bless one another. We don't do this often. But verses 11 through 13 are in the form of an old-fashioned blessing. Now, what was an old-fashioned blessing? An old-fashioned blessing is a prayer, but it's a declaration before God. It's a declaration of our desire for you. You know, my desire for you, Paul's desire for the Thessalonians. Asking God's blessing on another. Now, it... It generally looks forward positively and expectantly. Here's the idea. And by the way, encourages that person to look forward positively and expectantly. This is my longing for you. This is my vision for you. This is my hope for you. And here's what he says. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ Direct our way unto you. May God direct us to you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound. And may the Lord in, help you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that we may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. There's a, there's a loftiness to this. There's a bigness to this blessing. By the way, this is the type of thing that we would always pray for all of us, all of one another, right? Unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all of his saints, it looks forward. Here's the principle. Let's encourage one another, as only we can, biblically. Let's stand. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Maybe there's someone. I, I'm not going to ask you. This is an unusual invitation. I'm not going to ask you about your heart today. I'm not going to ask you to examine your own heart. What I'd like you to do is to think about who the Holy Spirit is laying upon your heart to encourage. Who does God want you to encourage? And this is a time to be thankful for them, to think about those pleasant memories, to look, uh, look for a way of sharing the good news, to provide encouragement. How can you encourage someone else? Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, the first step, you're not going to have the tools to encourage someone else until you know Christ as Savior. It has to be real in your life. And so if you'd like to know Jesus Christ as Savior, Pastor French, Pastor Jason, we'll be down here. But let's take the time to pray about encouraging others. Let's go to the Lord. make you to abound and increase in love one toward another, toward all men, even as I do towards you.
that the goal may, that he might establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Amen. God bless.